The accomplishments of ACT UP are staggering. Now, just to name a few, over the course of six years, from 1987 to 1993, the grassroots political group did things like create a fast-track system where those who were sick could access unapproved and experimental drugs, they ended insurance exclusion for people with AIDS, they made needle exchange legal in New York City, they also ran a four-year campaign to force the CDC to change the official definition of AIDS to include women. This specifically was a massive deal, which we will get into more in a bit. And in the process of all of this, they redefined how the world thought about people with HIV AIDS and also the larger LGBTQ community. Instead of being weak or invisible, suddenly we were seen as this vibrant and powerful grassroots force. So how did they do it? Well, that is where Sarah Shulman comes in. Her new book called Let the Record Show explores just that. It breaks down the many misconceptions about ACT UP and HIV, many of which I had as you will soon hear, and the book serves as an utterly crucial guidebook for effective activism. ACT UP forced the world to change, and now with this book, their methods, exactly how they went about it, can now be seen and studied and applied to other movements. So let's hear it. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and A with Sarah Shulman. You know, reading the book, the thing that struck me over and over was what a massive and highly organized operation it was. You know, there was different subcommittees working simultaneously and arranging meetings and planning actions. I think it's hard to convey just how complex the organization was. Do you find that that is a common misunderstanding? Well, the history of ACT UP has been very narrowed. And in fact, the whole history of AIDS and AIDS activism has been narrowed and whitewashed down to a handful of individuals. So there, this is the first really accurate history. One of the great successes of the movement is that it was so flexible. It didn't work on consensus. There was simultaneity of response. What it really is, is little silos of groups of like-minded people working together on things that really matter to them in an effective way. And those different groups standing side by side and trading in and out and supporting each other's projects. And that was the open structure, the radical democracy of ACT UP. And I just like want to make sure everyone knows like the size that we're talking about. You say that ACT UP had about 500 to 800 people in a meeting and that um, the biggest action, which was Stop the Church, drew about 7,000 people. Yes, but that's actually quite small because mass movements or very effective movements, we think of as having hundreds of thousands of people. But this was really like a vanguard movement. I mean, it's funny that you call it small because to me, I'm thinking about 500 and 800 people in a room and I don't understand how you could get anything accomplished. Well, most of what was accomplished was not accomplished in the meeting itself. It was accomplished in these small groups called affinity groups that were like 10 to 20 people who would meet separately from the Monday night meeting and would plan actions or committees of the larger organization that would work on a particular action or a particular campaign. So the Monday night meeting was just a gathering of all of these different functional entities that were doing their own projects at the same time. I mean, you write that with the affinity group, sometimes they would plan an action and you wouldn't hear about it until after the fact. But I just wonder, like, what kind of approval process or consensus was there to make sure that that was in line with the mission? Like, if their idea is like, hey, let's burn down the Capitol, you can't find out about that after the fact. Well, affinity groups were not accountable to the Monday night meeting. They would do, they would plan often illegal or you know, civil disobedience actions to support larger actions that the group was officially organizing, but they worked privately. The larger group did provide legal support for them, but there was no consensus in ACT UP. The only point of unity was direct action to end the AIDS crisis. That's it. So that meant you couldn't be doing social service provision, for example. It had to be direct action, and it had to be to end the AIDS crisis. If you were doing those two things, you could really do anything. The group did not have to all agree. So, for example, if you wanted to do needle exchange on the Lower East Side to provoke an arrest, to provoke a test case, and if I thought that was a terrible idea, I wouldn't try to stop you from doing it. I just wouldn't do it. 
if instead I wanted to interrupt mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral and you were against that, you just wouldn't go. And that was understood, I guess, if you're going to be a member, that there will not be consensus. No, because ACT UP never theorized itself. So it just evolved that way without any sort of discussion. It was There was very little theory in ACT UP. And as Maxine Wolf said, theory emerges from action. So if you put action first, then you have to make decisions about how to do your action. And that's where your values come to surface. But if you're debating theory before you act, you'll end up in very polarized positions and you won't have anything on the table. I think that that I find that so fascinating because the actions, like the types of actions that you did were very like well-defined. For example, you write that everything was connected. It was designed to produce a larger outcome, not just stand on its own. And then what I found particularly interesting was in terms of video, which can be a really important tool. Video, you write, if the media does not inspire real people to act, then it is not effective. It is simply entertainment. That is so precise and useful. So I guess it surprises me that there was not a like defined theory. Well, the video people, a lot of the people who worked in video did come from the Whitney program. So they had studied aesthetic theory. They were a little bit different than the, the other parts of the political activists. Because you have to understand that when AIDS first was noticed in 1981-82, video as we know it had not evolved yet. So when Jim Hubbard was collecting footage to preserve from the beginning of AIDS activism, the earliest stuff was actually film. There was no technology for recording off a television set. So people would aim their film cameras at the screen of the television and make film of it. But in the middle of ACT UP, the camcorder was invented. And so that created a brand new technology that ACT UP could seize. And the people who started to do video activism, many of them had come from this artistic theoretical background. I think another misconception that a lot of people have, and certainly one that I had, I thought of Larry Kramer as the sole creator and leader of ACT UP. And he was influential for sure, but not in charge or one of the core leaders by any means. I interviewed 188 surviving members of ACT UP and not one person considered Larry Kramer to be the leader of ACT UP. And this is very interesting. ACT UP in its time was represented inaccurately in the media. Because when we go back to the 80s, we have to remember that media, government, and corporate life were all controlled by white males. And gay men among those white males were closeted. It's nothing like it is now. So the white male media would come to act up and they would only see white men. They would interview white men. They would use photographs of white men. Other people were there doing things, but it wouldn't be covered. And it's only when you look at act up's own media that you actually see a more accurate representation. And now we like look back at uh, everything that ACT UP did accomplish. And I think like one of the questions is like, how did they do that? And one of the big factors was the inside-outside approach that you highlight in the book. The inside-outside strategy was very controversial. And in some ways it helped and in some ways it hurt. But this is back to the reality that, you know, in the government and in pharma, it was upper-class white males and in the media. So the idea was that men in ACT UP who came from Harvard, who came from J.P. Morgan, they could connect with these guys. You know, the guys in the government identified with them. Larry Kramer went to Yale with the head of Bristol Myers, and he set up catered lunches between this element of ACT UP and these corporations. But when it came time for women of color or drug users or homeless people to win a change of the CDC definition of AIDS so that women could get benefits and get experimental drug trials, there was no one in power who could identify with those women. And so when you contrast, they had to work for four years to get that definition change. It took them two years to even get a meeting. So when you contrast these two campaigns, which took place in the same movement, right? What you really learn is that people develop strategies based on their social position. Your access to power, how close you are to power, and how much power identifies with you really determines what your strategies are going to be. And that's why ACT UP had to have so many different strategies simultaneously. And so this inside-outside perspective or approach was that these men, primarily white, upper class, like you say, were meeting, having meetings and like working this out one-on-one. Insider meetings. And the outsiders, the rest of us, were on the streets being threatening, 
scaring the people inside the meetings, you know, and giving those people weight and legitimacy. When you say it's controversial, because to me, I thought like that was like the key to success is these two approaches simultaneously. I mean, let's look at where we are today and see where we succeeded and where we failed. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, Linda Villarosa, who is the Black lesbian writer for the New York Times, she had a cover story in 2017 showing that today, you know, Black gay men in the U.S. South have a higher rate of HIV infection than any country in the world. So what we ended up with was treatments that can defeat HIV. If you're infected today, you can live a normal lifespan if you can access those treatments. But we don't have a functional health care system. So people don't have access to those treatments. And that's where we failed, was on access. Because we had a movement whose access was depending dependent on certain kinds of elite status and recognition. And are you drawing the connection to the movement was a success for that group of white gay men that were meeting on the inside? No, I think that the movement, the people who actually benefited, I think ACT UP's greatest achievement was changing the CDC definition. Because once women could get into experimental drug trials, drugs could be tested on women. And today, millions of women globally take drugs for HIV disease that work for them because ACT UP did a four-year campaign forcing pharma and the government to let women into experimental drug trials. It's the most direct global benefit. So speaking now, hearing that like the definition of AIDS did not include women, in hindsight, that just sounds completely shocking and baffling. And so it sounds incredibly like a simple problem with a simple solution to just add women to the official definition of AIDS. But in fact, like the opposite is true. Yes. So in the 1960s, there was a drug called thalidomide that was given to pregnant women. And many of them had children who were born without limbs as a result. So the ensuing lawsuits um, made the pharmaceutical company have to pay out millions of dollars in settlements. So from then on, women were banned from experimental drug trials because they were afraid of birth defects. And this is always interesting because the woman herself is never the, the concern of medicine or the government or pharma. It's the child, the potential child. And this comes up later. In fact, this is the issue, one of the issues that split ACT UP later was a a trial for pregnant women that was focused on the fetus and not on the woman. We picked this up with this young actress named Rebecca Cole, who came from Northwestern to New York to try to make it. And she was working at a bar and somebody came into the bar and said, we need to hire people to work at the new thing called the AIDS hotline. It pays $10 an hour. And she needed $10 an hour. So she took the job and there was no information about AIDS. People would call and they had nothing to tell them because nobody knew anything. Right. And one day she gets a call from a woman in Connecticut who says, I have AIDS and I tried to get into a, a drug trial. And they said that no women are allowed. Rebecca thought that's impossible. So she started calling drug trials and she found out that, in fact, they all banned women. So she called the CDC and made an appointment and traveled there and had a meeting with them to say that women were being excluded. Now, this is the beginning of the solidarity movement with women with HIV. But it also really shows you what kind of people joined ACT UP. Like people had enormous amount of you know, proactivity and who are completely unable to stand still and be bystanders in the face of a cataclysm. So that's how that started. Then a poverty lawyer named Terry McGovern, who was only 29, started to notice that her clients could not get AIDS diagnoses, even though they were dying. And a nurse named Risa Denenberg, who also was in ACT UP, she was seeing low-income women with HIV, and she saw that they also could not get diagnoses. And both of these women came to ACT UP, ACT UP's Women's Committee, and this became their campaign. Well, I mean, we were talking about how influential, like the pop culture depictions of HIV were for me. We've only seen women historically depicted as caregivers for men with AIDS. Anybody like during this, the crisis was always in support of usually gay men. It was never a woman with HIV. Yeah, that's a complete distortion. That's a sexist distortion. My interviews show that there was no gender differential in terms of who was a caretaker and act up. Affinity groups would become care groups when members of the affinity group were dying. Men and women were both caretakers and all activists. And it's interesting because over the years, many, many, many people have emailed me saying, can you connect me to a lesbian who was a caretaker of someone with AIDS? And I'm like, no, 
I can connect you to people who were leaders, who were activists, who were theoreticians. And then they're like, well, do you know anyone who knows someone who was a caretaker? There's just a real desire to create this category. Well, it seems like, too, based on your book and that, that the media only wants to tell the single story of, like, the gay man who's dying of AIDS. And so you were sending out pictures of, like, people at protests and healthy gay men who have HIV. And they're like, no, 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 we only want to see people who are in, like, a hospital bed. Yes, Donna Binder is a very important person in this whole story. She was a photographer, journalist who was photographing ACT UP. And in those days, you know, you would photograph, you'd go home to your dark room, you'd develop the photos, and you'd physically take them to the photo editors at Time Magazine or US News and World Report or whatever. And she would be bringing in these photos and they'd say, no, we want people with AIDS. We want people who are emaciated, covered with KS, lying in bed. And she would say, these are people with AIDS. These, And finally, after ACT UP disrupted mass, At St. Patrick's Cathedral in 1989, finally they turned around and they started wanting activist photos. But it's really about the individual who's up against the institution. Having that conversation with the person in power, sometimes jeopardizing their own ability to earn a living, that helps people change their minds. And that is a fascinating byproduct of these actions that, you know, you're protest, you're doing stop the church to protest the Catholic church, this specifically this one person, but also the images of that are redefining how people view people with AIDS. That is a rebellion that was heard around the world. It really changed things for us. And what's interesting is that afterwards, when ACTIP evaluated the action, people were angry, but no one ever tried to kick anybody out. No one was ever kicked out of ACTIP. It was an organization that of a community and a community, the gay community saw itself as something that anyone could be part of. It didn't have this concept of itself as superior and that therefore you would exclude people. You write about like the visual identity of the group and how that was important for branding. You describe it as like tight black jeans and slogan t-shirts and also short hair and clean shaven. Am I understanding correctly that that was to project cleanliness because clean meant healthy in that way? It was a few things. The, the, the first generation to really be hit by AIDS was the clone generation. So that was the West Village. It was like flannel shirts and handlebar mustaches and long hair. You know, that was the, the Fire Island, the Saint. You know, that was this whole generation. And ACT UP was younger and based in the East Village. So they took on this more, in a sense, warrior stance, and it was more fashionable. But I do believe underneath all of that, that this clean look with the clean t-shirt was very much about being clean. It's kind of amazing that today, like, quote unquote, clean, that kind of like verbiage has like lasted until like my generation. And also, you know, being HIV positive today is a completely different meaning if you have access to treatment. But of course, we're talking about a time when there was no treatment. So a lot of people didn't want to get tested because what then what would they do? But there's a big closet today for people who are HIV positive because there's not a community of people who are positive. And there's not a voice for the positive person. Like who is the positive spokesperson in America today? It's the same people who were you know, Magic Johnson, people who came out about being positive decades ago. So we have two generations of positive people who are not visible. And that's certainly not not a good way to be because the stigma around HIV is completely undeserved. There's so many diseases that you can get that are so much worse than HIV, but it maintains a stigma because of its connection to anal sex and to needles. And so it's queered in that way. And that's why the stigma is maintained. Well, I think that you bring up a great point because today with access to proper health care, you can live a long, healthy life. But back then, I think that we really forget how um, like grotesque it could get for a person with AIDS, if that's okay to say. I mean, AIDS is a horrible disease, you know, because you have no immune system. So not only were there skin cancers that I think people still know about today, but your body couldn't metabolize nutrition. And there was like horrible diarrhea and people were just becoming skeletal. They had neuropathy in their legs. They had thrush, like white infection on in their mouths. Um, it was hard to swallow. People got dementia, went blind, um, you know, couldn't breathe. Your whole body stops functioning. 
Something I was wondering too is that the most famous and enduring slogan from this era is the silence equals death. And that is usually depicted in the poster with an upside down pink triangle, which harkens back to the Holocaust. Why was the choice made to connect the AIDS crisis with the Holocaust? That's a very interesting question. So let's just say that Silence Equals Death was made by a collective before ACT UP started. Abram Finkelstein, his lover had just died of AIDS, and he and some other people got together who were art directors, and they wanted to just do something. And they worked on it for six months, and they made this poster, and they put it up all over the city. And then, and this turned out to be just two weeks before Larry Kramer's speech, so when ACT UP finally started, so Larry didn't start ACT UP. He gave a speech that people came to, and then people in the audience said, let's meet again. And they met. He did come to that meeting, but and then somebody else had the idea for the name ACT UP. And then Silence Equals Death group decided to donate the image to ACT UP. So all those buttons and posters were ACT UP's first fundraising Now, the connection to the Holocaust is because there were so many Jews in gay liberation at the time. There's Larry Kramer and there's Sarah Shulman and there's, you know, there's just, there's so many people, Lillian Faderman. And, you know, and when you look back on it, I think it's that this post-Holocaust generation of Jews were trained with some kind of social justice bent or an idea that you're supposed to serve your community, yet we were excluded from our families and from the Jewish community. So we had this orientation towards leadership and and service. And I think that that's my theory anyway, about why so many Jews, Martin Duberman, so many ended up in leadership in the gay movement at that time. But also this is pre-gentrification New York, right? So that whole range of like white Protestants that come with gentrification really weren't there yet. So most people in ACT UP who were white were Italian, Irish, or Jewish. And then there were a lot of Latinos. There of course were some wasps like Peter Staley and Mark Harrington, but not many. Today, ACT UP is looked back on and revered. How well-liked or not were people back then? ACT UP was not liked. You have to remember that many, many, many people died in the closet. In order to, this was a time when there was not even a gay rights bill in New York City. You could still be fired from a job, kicked out of an apartment, or refused service in a restaurant or hotel in New York City when AIDS started. And nationally, sodomy laws did not come down until 2003. So these were people with no rights. Familial homophobia was very dire at the time and impacted everybody. So these were a group of severely oppressed people across the board. Now we have a rhetoric about white gay men and we understand that more privileges are available to white gay men. But at the time, white gay men with AIDS were a profoundly, profoundly oppressed group just like everybody else with AIDS. And of course, homeless people with AIDS, people of color, women with AIDS all had it worse. But still, nobody cared what happened to you. Your family didn't care. Your government didn't care. And people had to join together and force the country to change against its will. And this is how successful political movements work. They force change. No one grants rights to anybody. They have to be forced. And that's one of the lessons of ACT UP. A lot of people in your interviews describe wanting to join ACT UP partially because it is such an attractive group of people, like to be in community with them. Was safe sex like emphasized amongst the group? Like how was that handled? Oh, yeah. AIDS was identified like 81, 82, right? And in the first five years, 40,000 people died. So in that period, there was a big fear of sexuality. A lot of gay men stopped having sex or were afraid to go out. With ACT UP, it was a rebirth of a sexual, gay sexual culture. And at the beginning of ACT UP, and you can see this in my interviews at the ACT UP Oral History Project, at the beginning, there was an assumption that everybody was positive because a lot of people didn't know what they were because they didn't get tested because there were no treatments. So people learned safe sex and it was just assumed. It did start to break down after a couple of years. There was a whole nightlife that was associated with ACT UP. There was a lesbian club, the Click Club, and a men's club called Meet that were run by people who were in ACT UP. And when there was supposedly unsafe sex at Meet, it was discussed on the floor of ACT UP. And it did break down. But for the first few years, there was not a difference between who was positive and who was negative. Then it went into a period where people 
who were negative didn't want to have sex with people who were positive. And that still exists today. And there's a lot of magical thinking about how you know someone's positive and how you know who someone's negative. But the truth is, a positive person who's on AIDS meds today is virally suppressed. And therefore, they are biologically incapable of infecting anybody. So the safest person to have sex with is a positive person who's on medication, whereas a person who doesn't know their status is a completely unsafe person. I mean, having lived through the height of the AIDS crisis, is that like astonishing to you that we've gotten that far? But we haven't gotten anywhere because we don't have a healthcare system. So all the things that we're talking about are only for people who have access to meds. I mean, in New York City, we still have 1,200, 1,600 deaths a year from AIDS. And it's underclass people mostly who are diagnosed in the emergency room. So there's people who have zero health care. And by the time they show up in the emergency room, it's too late. I mean, most of our discussion has been about the past, but as you say, this is not over. And like the stats that you start the book with, I think are shocking to people. 32 million people in the world have died of AIDS complications. Yeah, it's almost 100,000 people who've died in New York City of AIDS. And how many people died on 9-11? 3,000. What's the difference in the way the city has responded to those two groups of of deaths? You know, the other thing is people whose parents died of AIDS. I mean, there's huge numbers of people whose parents died of AIDS. Only in the last few years have people started to find each other. But it's a group of people, of course, every race and class who, you know, have never been identified. You know, reading your book, I couldn't help but think who is doing this work now, who has carried on this mantle with this level of organization, but also like effectiveness and urgency. Like, do you see a group out there now doing this? Well, I think there's a lot of people out there who want change. And I think we have very diverse movements, all of whom have queer people in leadership, interestingly, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's the Dream Defenders, whether it's Palestine Solidarity, any radical movement that you look at in America now has integrated queer and trans people into their movements. So, you know, there's a huge wish for change. And that's why my book really focuses on the how to, how to build a campaign, you know, trying to encourage people to have simultaneity of response and not consensus. We're in a very moralistic time right now and a punitive time. And there's a real push for everyone to think the same way and speak the same way. And that does not create political change. And historically, it has never worked. People can only be where they're at. And that's the way it is. And people are going to have their own analyses and they're going to have their own priorities. And the more you can facilitate the largest number of people in a big tent way, responding in a way that makes sense to them, the more likely you are to have a paradigm shift. And and so last question about the book, but... You know, you were a member of ACT UP, you did the ACT UP Oral History Project, you've written five novels, have dealt with AIDS, yet putting it all together in this book this way, are you still learning new things about ACT UP in this time? Oh, sure. There's so much that I, I could have written a book the same size that had completely different information. You know, I only interviewed 188 people. There were hundreds and hundreds of people alive today who were in ACT UP. There's so many more stories to tell. But I really wanted to focus not on the nostalgia side but on the practical side, how to be effective and why this movement was effective and what we can learn from it today. And that was Sarah Shulman, author of Let the Record Show. That book, which was edited by the great Jackson Howard, comes out on May 18th. You can pre-order it right now. And it's also worth noting the documentary about ACT UP that Sarah worked on is available for free on YouTube. That is called United in Anger. Now, if you enjoyed this interview, please make sure that you are subscribed in whatever app you're listening to and come subscribe to our newsletter. You can find that at lgbtqpodcast.com. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters. I'll see you next week.